Hello everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Attention to Detail, number one. So a while back I asked uh, subscribers for suggestions for names for a catch-all type of show um, similar to Monday Night Meat Loaf or Saturday Night Special and um, I got a lot of excellent suggestions and uh, but just couldn't get away from the fact that attention to detail is the most frequent comment uh, that I get in practically all the videos. So I just thought that'd be a very appropriate uh, name for this and so this is the first one. Uh, along those lines, a uh, big shout out to all my subscribers. Uh, thank you, thank you for all your very, very kind, generous comments and uh, support. Uh, it's very encouraging to know that the things that you put out are appreciated and are helpful and inspiring. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. So um, it's nice to hear that, that that's happening. Uh, it wouldn't be much point in doing this if, if it wasn't. Um, and uh, thank you that I'm rolling up here on 19,000 subscribers here shortly, probably within 50, uh, probably by the time this is, is posted, uh, probably be 19,000. Uh, not my motivation, but it is nice to, uh, to have more subscribers, and uh, uh, it is nice to get some some income from from these. Uh, it does take a lot of time, additional time to spend the time to to uh, video these things. So very much appreciated. Uh, one thing that I'm not sure a lot of the YouTubers might be aware of is that uh, I am on Instagram, and I'm much more active on Instagram than I am on YouTube. Uh, I hope to correct that, but uh, I post typically something almost every day. Uh, same thing, uh, educational uh, intentions with what I post. Try to post things that will uh, uh, just show some details about machining, teach teach something that some, some people might not know. So uh, lots of things on there. Uh, I am Robin Renzetti on Instagram, just, just my name. And uh, you can search for that and uh, if you're interested. And there's lots of posts on there already. And uh, there'll be a lot more. So this is also a opportunity to cover some things that there were comments on previous uh, videos. And uh, clear up some details where people might have some confusion on, on those things. And uh, one of those is on the precision ground uh, tool room stones. A lot of people ask, can't you do the tool room stones? using the three-plate method. And there are shortcomings to the three-plate method that people need to be aware of. And I just did a little short clip here to uh, show you what some of those are. So. Limitations of the pure three-plate method. Pure meaning three plates, some means of modifying the surface to match each other, and that's it. No other measuring instruments. Several people, many people actually have said, why can't you use the three plate method to rub three stones on each other and get them flat? And I think it shows that there's some misunderstanding about the nuances of the three, three plate method. And I hope to uh, clarify that in this, in this uh, section. So here's a plate. I have my A plate, I have my B plate on top. I lap, scrape, whatever, and I've got these perfectly matching. I remove B and I scrape C to match exactly. Then I combine C and B to check and see where we are. And we're perfect. Okay, these three plates must be flat because we have three mutually uh, evenly bearing surfaces. So, got to be flat, right? I don't think so, Tim. And that is because a absolute requirement of the three plate method is that you must be able to ro rotate your part 90 degrees when you're doing your checking. And now you can see that when you rotate 90 degrees, all of a sudden you see what's going on and you've got big trouble. Yet all these match perfectly to each other. So um, you could take your repeat a meter, zero it on your quadruple A surface plate and come in here and check and say, okay, well, let me see what's going on. Straight, 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 
straight, straight, straight, straight. What's up? You got to be careful. You have to make sure you're measuring in every in every uh, direction. Concave in the one direction, convex in the other. So that shows that how far out things can be. The actually the best method for checking this in whether you're talking about machine bases or whatever is using the two-footed twist gauge. Uh, much underused, much underappreciated. All it means is a piece of something rigid, two feet, a central measuring point, and we come in here and we can set this like this, zero this, and the gauge could actually be connected to the plate. And then we turn 90 degrees and see what happens to the other corner. And all of a sudden we can see the huge difference in height here that we have. And that tells us which direction the twist is and also how high the corner to corner uh, height variation is. So very powerful tool. This literally can just be feet super glued onto a piece of box tubing or a rectangle stock or whatever. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. So um, don't hesitate to use this. A scraping uh, bases of machines like something like the base of a uh, surface grinder which has two rails side by side and this, you know, you can fool around with a level all day. You're never going to beat the two, foot, two footed twist gauge um, measuring it with a, however accurate an indicator you have, but this will really show your twist very clearly and uh, independent of level. So that's how you can get in trouble. Uh, why is the, the, um, there a problem? Well, the stones are rectangular. If you have square stones, have at it. You can use a three plate method. Make sure you turn 90 degrees and you can generate flat surfaces. Uh, but since the stones are rectangular, when you go to uh, do the alignment at 90 degrees, you can't get full bearing because you've got one rectangle, you know, rectangle and rectangle and you can't get the bearing that you need to check to see what's going on. So that's why uh, my answer to the question is, can you do it with the three plate method? The answer is no. Now, obviously I said that the answer to the question, can you use the three plate method on rectangular stones is no. But yes, if you want to nitpick, you can say, well, you, you can still, even though you can't get full coverage, full bearing, when you turn the stones 90 degrees when they're rectangular, you can see if you have twist. So just for all those who are going to say, well, that's not quite true. Yeah, you're right. It's not quite true if you want to really fight it. But you need to be aware of the phenomenon. So this is an opportunity to give a shout out to some other uh, YouTube machinists. Uh, Stan Zinkowski, uh, Shadon HKW, um, has an excellent channel that has things on grinding, uh, electrical, just a, a range of things. He's also the fellow that uh, sponsors the, or does the uh, Summer Bash. Um, so lots of good content there. There's Steve Summers uh, and has some interesting content. He has a large shaper and is doing some interesting things on that, making some tooling. There's um, Steve Barton, Solid Rock Machine Shop Incorporated, a uh, guy with a lot of tool and die experience. Um, is doing a lot of great stuff with showing uh, just grinding practices, finessing grinding setups, things, jig grinding, uh, lots of stuff that you might not see other places. Really good stuff there. Uh, his sons and him, he are uh, having, developing a home shop and um, good stuff there. And uh, Edge Precision, uh, Peter does some really crazy stuff with uh, Integrex and other CNC machines on oil field type uh, things. Just some really interesting setups and uh, unusual ways of handling very large parts and intricate parts that require some crazy things, uh, intermediate fixtures and things, so good stuff. And um, Joe Pizinski, um, also very good stuff. Uh, he covers a lot of just your common sense things, got some tips and tricks from, from long time experience. Um, also a really good channel. So here's some teaser items. Uh, these are the digitals that are going on the Mitsui surface grinder rebuild. Uh, these are the scales that I uh, purchased. One long scale, cut it apart, bought a spare head, assembled those. I'll be covering uh, some of the things I did there. These are my precision tool room spindles that I've been uh, showing on Instagram as I've been progressing along on these. There'll be a full uh, video 
uh, series done on producing these. These are going to be ultra stiff, uh, ultra precise, hopefully, uh, uh, spindles. Uh, I believe that they'll be in the sub 5 millionths TIR range, probably even better than that, but extremely stiff, much stiffer than an air bearing. So uh, these will be um, very, very handy items, and I'll be showing uh, some of the design aspects of these and the actual making of them. So those are just some, some teaser for what's coming up. Another thing I plan to cover in these uh, attention to detail is just little tips and tricks uh, that don't have any you know place to be a, a video on their own, but are uh, things I find useful and are, are uh, I think are worthwhile passing on. Here's a tip on uh, chuck backing plates and just the versatility of being able to move things around in the shop chucking wise. Uh, make my own backing plates for the harding here, the taper nose harding. Um, this is um, gray iron, and uh, so I machined up a bunch of these for various things. But uh, the advantage of having a backing plate without the typical recess is that you can do flats, as shown here on this uh, on this chuck where uh, those flats are surface ground uh, nice and perpendicular to the mounting face and they uh, that surface rides right up against the chuck back and what that allows me to do is to take this chuck off and just with the part still in there and go over and sit right in the uh, vise grab on those two flats resting on these surfaces don't even need parallels I can go do my end drilling on this part without even removing it from the chuck and uh, then come back if I have to do other operations. Obviously, if you had multiple pieces, uh, you would do your multiple pieces, take the chuck, go mount it in the mill once, put the pieces in and out of the chuck. But uh, in this particular case, I just have a single piece. So I'm just going to grab my, uh, my uh, big adjustable here, pop the, uh, the whole chuck right off the parting, and uh, that's it. I'll go over to the mill. So I come over to the mill, we grab, grab this, sit down on our surfaces, got a nice big flat area, haven't lost anything, still, still true uh, as far as the part and the chuck, and now I can just go ahead and indicate in and work on that, take it out, go back to the, uh, go back to the um, lathe if necessary, and uh, just one note, is when you're going to do this and you have a chuck like some of mine that only have a single uh, wrench hole you want to make sure that when you do your flats that your wrench is some the wrench hole relative to your flats keep in mind you're going to be drilling mounting holes in your backing plate to mount your chuck on uh, the um, you need to make sure that this wrench preferably is over here in this zone so you can actually take your t-wrench and uh, open and close the chuck. Obviously, if you needed to, you could make a, a, a socket adapter to go in there and, and work in wherever you end up. But uh, on all my other chucks that where I need this, I have my other, I can get to this one back here if I need to for um, this chuck. But um, on all my other chucks, I make sure that that's in this general area. Another thing mentioned, uh, and I see mentioned often uh, in a lot of the different videos, is airy points and bessel points and uh, also seems that there's a little confusion there. Airy points are the points at which the ends of a bar are still parallel, meaning the sag is such that the ends end up being perfectly vertical, parallel. Purpose for that, why would you want that to, to be that way? If you're using interferometric methods of measuring the distance, meaning you're going to ring uh, a reflector on one end of the gauge and have a uh, optical flap on the other end, and you're going to use light wave measurements to measure the actual length of the item, those being exactly parallel are pretty important for that type of measurement. Uh, so that actual distance is uh, 0.21132 times the length in from each end. Each support is that distance in. 
21132. Now, that is not uh, typically what you would want for what people think of flatness. They often use the Bessel points for that. Bessel points are the point of support such that the actual overall length of the bar changes the least. It, sh it shortens by the least amount. And uh, the purpose of that would be if you're measuring by other means, you have made the bar as long as possible. Obviously, if the bar sags, you know, in a big support at the end, it's going to sag the most and the distance is going to shorten up the most. So the longest that you can get the bar supported on two points is the bezel points. And those are point two two oh three times the length in from each end. The actual points that most people want to use is the minimum sag due to gravity points. Meaning you have two points, you have a bar that does this over the points, the ends and the middle sag equally and if they're equal, that's the best you can do as far as having it, having it uh, be minimum sag. And that distance is 0.2232. That one I, I remember without looking at my cheat sheet here. So that's the actual distance that you want to use when you're talking about supporting something with minimum sag. Important thing to remember is all of those things are of a something that has uniform cross-section. As soon as it's not uniform cross-section and uniform density, all bets are off. Those numbers are no good. So it doesn't apply to a surface grinder table of varying cross-section and things. It's better than nothing, but it doesn't apply to that when you, when you have something that's not uniform cross-section there. Bessel points are darn close. And for when you get right down to it, you're talking about a difference of 3,000 uh, 0.003 times the length. So a 10 inch item, you're talking about a 30 thousandths difference in the positioning of that point, which is pretty stinking small. And most people probably aren't going to hit the support that close anyhow. Uh, but it is important to know the technical difference there and be using the proper one. This is a handy uh, block that I made. Just some chunks of A2 junk that I had laying around that were already hardened. I ground them. This is the center height off the gang plate, this distance here. This is super glued on top of it. Uh, it actually has a relief in the center so that the glue film thickness doesn't affect the actual matchup. So there's actually a very few thousandths of gap, except for the very end here and here that actually sits, so that this is a representative of the uh, center height. So you can use this either way. And in this case here, I can come down here and I can set my boring bar. My boring bar obviously doesn't go in that uh, orientation when I'm using it but I can come down here and use it to set my center height uh, rotating the bar around here to get my center height uh, so just a handy item if you have a gang plate machine and you don't have a block like this very handy I also use it on the gang plate and I'll put a uh, indicator in the spindle and then set the indicator with this if I'm after very precise center heights and I can go either set it here or here for setting tools either direction whether they're upside down or right side up and then you can drive with the indicator and tweak your heights and get whatever amount of above or below center you're after so extremely simple but um, might not be something you think of making people were concerned about the plate moving with weight like if you put roll out a drawer or you do something that the thing's moving around and it is yes the only time that the plate staying still and being super uh, immobile is if you're going to try to measure the straightness of it using a level uh, without differential because just standing on one end of the floor or the other on this plate moves a precision level in the center. I can see if I stand on this end and I stand on the other end of the plate just standing on the floor not touching the plate, um, the bubble moves. So that's, if you're measuring using level without differential levels, then all of a sudden level becomes critical. Differential levels, that's the whole purpose of them, is that one level stays stationary while you do your, your traverses, your runs, and it um, negates any tilting effects that come from just the weight of the level itself moving, which does move things, uh, and gives you it gives you accurate readings that that tilt caused by gravitation by by movement of the plate um, is is compensated for. 
once you have calibrated the plate, level is irrelevant. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you put you know, every plate moves. If you put a 300 pound piece on this, this end of the plate, the plate's going to move. It's not going to be level anymore because most plates are supported on just rubber, glued on rubber feet. And those things are going to compress some with additional weight. They're going to move. The level's going to change. So all the concerns about uh, the plate moving those minute amounts is, um, is unwarranted. Also, people were concerned about this box not being rigid. Um, if you were here and um, rolled this thing around or just pushed on it, tried to push, move this thing while it's sitting up when it's jacked up on its feet, um, you would relax and realize, wow, that thing is really stiff with the um, additional bottom plates with it being welded together and um, the fact that you've got braced panels inside, um, the stiffness of this is very good and, and this, this is not shaky in the least. It's every bit as rigid as a, probably more rigid than a actual tubular frame table. A lot of people mentioned about why didn't you just use uh, spherical contacts, use standard um, um, kinematic mount type arrangements, you know, with a ball and a V and all those things. Um, one of the things that always has to be calculated when you're designing kinematic mounts is the Hertzian contact stresses of the elements that are touching each other. All that big word, Hertzian contact stress, all it means is you analyze what the contact stresses are caused by the ball or whatever it is, cylinder, whatever. Under a given force, there is uh, compressive forces and shear forces that are generated in the, in the contact patch. They actually occur below the surface. And if you have something where you exceed the compressive uh, strength of the material, that's what causes a dent, a Brunel mark, um, whatever you want to call it. And obviously anything kinematic, if that happens, you're, you're sunk, you're done, because now all of a sudden you don't have this perfect surface, smooth surface where things can seep and move into their, their preferred location. So uh, for a plate that weighs 1,300 pounds, you can't just use ordinary balls. You have to use canoe uh, spheres and uh, V-blocks and things that increase the radius much, much larger so that the Hertzian contact stresses go down and you get in the realm of what can work. Even if all those things work, with thermal changes and things, those um, elements have to be able to slide on each other. That's a whole another animal. So I'm pretty convinced that the Turkite uh, and what I have here is probably one of the most, the freest three-point supports that's relatively not influencing that can be accomplished on a surface plate. Uh, remember the plate still has to be rigidly held. Another thing that people mention is what about the Wiffle Tree support like seen in uh, Foundations of Mechanical Accuracy? And that's one like you saw Dale Derry do on his surface plate where you have two feet and then over here you have a, a, a balance beam that supports in two places. The only thing that that accomplishes um, on a plate is to minimize the uh, distortion on the single support end as far as it's sagging because instead of a single support it has two supports. So in that regard, it makes both ends of the plate equally stiff. If you're ever doing something on your plate where you're concerned, you always want to do your work on the two-footed end as far as working in, the, um, in this direction uh, on the plate, on the, on the short direction, because uh, that has the best support and will deform the least. The torsional twistability of the plate endwise is not improved with Wiffle Tree at all. So it does not make the plate infinitely, it doesn't make it stiffer. Um, it does make it uh, deflect less on what would have been the single point end, but that's, that's all. Uh, so it doesn't, it, Wiffle Tree has its place, but it doesn't, it doesn't work uh, magic. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, first episode of uh, Attention to Detail. Uh, it will also be something that lets me put out videos a little bit quicker. Uh, or more frequently where uh, they don't have to be a major production and um, so that that should be a good thing I, I enjoy getting the videos out it's just that I'm, I'm usually really busy and uh, I'm always really busy uh, it's just a matter of cramming videos in when I can 
So I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, please uh, subscribe if you haven't, and share, tell your friends, leave comments, ask questions, and uh, I'll be back.